How are you all doing? I'm out on Cape Cod, so for me, it's uh, just a little bit after 10 o'clock. So, but I'm hyped up on coffee and uh, I've got more to come. So with that, let's get started. So um, Leslie had mentioned that I work with a variety of global clients, a lot of names that uh, you'd be familiar with. And I thought I'd um, share some of the different types of organizations that I've worked with because they all work with design in different aspects. Uh, some of it is very specific product design like Kohler and making bathtubs and Clorox making cleaning supplies and Pfizer making drugs that will save our lives um, as well as makeup or experiences like Disney. So design is such a wide, wide gamut from graphic design to industrial design. And, and so I've worked with all kinds of designers when we're in a room creating new products, new strategies, new ways of doing things. So just to give you a little bit of an agenda, we're gonna spend a little bit of time talking about mindset, the attitudes, the behaviors that enable good creative thinking and innovation. Then we'll spend a little bit of time playing with some tools and techniques used to generate options, um, communicate direction, alignment, commitment, as we explore creative process and skill set to help pull the car out of the water. And so they're having some success with that, successfully using the red crane to pull this little white car out of the water. And it's going pretty well for them. And then suddenly they've got a bigger problem. So now the white car is back in the, in the water and now the red crane is, is soon to be in the water. So what is it? What do you think they do? Well, what they chose to do was to bring in a bigger crane, but this time it's a green crane. So they were using the green crane to pull the white car out of the water and then bring the red crane out of the water. And it's going pretty well for them, being successful. And they're now pulling the, the red crane out of the water. And then suddenly, now they've got a bigger problem. So the white car is back in the water, the red crane's in the water, the green crane's soon to be in the water. What do you think they do in the chat? Anybody? What do you think they do? Bigger crane? Yep. Mega crane. Oh, everyone's got it. That's exactly what they do. They bring in a bigger crane, only this time it's blue. So, um, anyone know the definition of insanity? As Einstein says, it's doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. But you know, how often when we're working on a challenge, we have something to solve, we figuratively just bring in a bigger crane or we change the color of the crane. And we find ourselves kind of in a figurative banging our head against the wall, trying to solve the problem by doing the same thing over and over again. So really what we're gonna spend some time on tonight is just looking at ways to do things differently, to give ourselves more options, more choices than just bringing in a bigger crane and changing the color. So does that sound, sound like a good plan? Okay. So again, using the chat, um, I would like you to share where are you and what are you doing when you get your best ideas? Where are you? What are you doing when you get your best ideas? So I ask this question a lot, and here's, some, here's the typical answers that I will get. So often uh, mind calm, calming activities, meditation, yoga, uh, reading, listening to music, <clears throat> listening to a lecture, going to a workshop, hanging out with friends, routine activities like doing the dishes, laundry, gardening, things like that, um, exercising, working out, riding your bike, uh, walking, that's a big one for me when I'm out walking my dog, driving or being the passenger in a car. Boy, I used to write a lot of papers when I was in doing my master's when I was driving in my head. Um, in bed, right before you fall asleep or when you first wake up in the morning. And the number one I will almost always hear is the shower in the bathroom, in the bathtub perhaps. Um, and so when people ask me what I do for a living, I say, you know, it's my job to bring the shower into the boardroom 
into the bathroom, into, into the Zoom room, into the classroom. So how do you bring that same type of thinking when we're not focused sitting at a boardroom table and that when we get our best ideas in? And so I'm hoping that this is the experience that you'll have with me today. So um, back in uh, 2016, the World Economic Forum met in Davos, Switzerland. And they were talking about um, the current workplace trends and what the skills that were going to be needed, um, mostly due to job disruption due to technology and automation. So looking forward to 2020, what skills would be needed? And interestingly, the number one skill was complex problem solving, but really not that far behind it, that was creativity. And what I thought was fascinating in looking at this old study was that you know, they didn't, we're forecasting at the time that we were gonna be dealing with a pandemic and COVID-19, but those same types of what are traditionally soft skills that, um, need, that would be helping for uh, dealing with automation and job loss are needed right now and what we're dealing with in this pandemic. So problem solving, creativity, um, coordinating with other people, which is basically collaboration, emotional intelligence, cognitive flexibility, resiliency. And these are all skills that people who are designers and are intrigued by design tend to already be wired for, those types of soft skills. Um, all of these skills are critical for good design. Um, so traditionally, the job market, they're looking for people used to always be looking for, you know, what have you done before? What's on your bio? What's on your resume? But now more and more organizations are looking for what's your skill set and how are you wired and how nimble are you and what kind of flexibility are you as a thinker? So interesting time to be, be a designer, to be a creative. So just a little bit more backstory on this, um, what the research says. You know, the research tells you that people can learn to be better creative thinkers. Everyone's creative in some way, they, they may express it differently. Groups that are trained in a common language on creativity, innovation, outperform non-trained groups. Creativity flourishes in environments where it's okay to make well-intentioned mistakes. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. 85% of the reasons teams don't achieve results are due to breakdown in communication and collaboration. And then finally, organizations trained in creative process report higher morale, more productivity than those who are not. So that's just to kind of, those of you who like to know the backstory and the validity behind it, there's lots of research that supports this. So um, when I'm talking about creativity, in innovation, you know, what does that mean? And just to kind of give you some terms or at least how I see the definitions, and there's lots of different ones out there. But for me, when I talk about creative thinking, it's about connecting previously unconnected thoughts, putting different things together. Creativity is then actually doing something with those thoughts. And innovation is when value is captured via that activity. So a lot of times I think about, I think one of the biggest things that get in the way when it's time to be creative is this thing here. You know, um, we get in our own way, our own attitude, our own mindset. Um, you know, sometimes it's things we tell ourselves that aren't so. So when I think about the creative process, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on mindset in the creative process and, and how we're wired, how we approach challenges. And so there are basically four stages in the creative process. So <clears throat> I'm assuming that all of you have had some exposure to different types of creative process. So where Wesley and I met was at the Creative Problem Solving Institute. So that's one of the, one of the kind of early processes that was established back in uh, the 1950s that was um, developed by Alex Osborne, who's the O and BBDO advertising. He's also the guy who coined the term brainstorming. So, um, but there's also design thinking, um, there's you know, design sprints, there's uh, six thinking hats. And so I'm just curious um, in the chat again, if you've had any training or exposure to any of the different 
design thinking methodologies training. Could you share kind of what type of creative process you've been exposed to or any type of training or workshops types? I'm just kind of curious. Um, feel free to share in the chat. But basically, no matter what label we, we put on them, um, any type of creative process, design process, goes through certain stages. Um, we might use different language to describe it, but there's always some type of a clarification stage. You know, this is when we turn over all the puzzle pieces. We want to look at the data, understand what's going on, identify um, what we're trying to solve for, what the real challenge is, etc. You know, once we have that data, that information, um, we we generate ideas, we ideate, um, lots of options, lots of ideas. We then take those ideas and make them workable. We develop them out and then we implement, we do something with them. We create an action plan and we do something. So we go through those four stages. And frankly, just as human beings, that's how we're wired to solve problems. Um, but as human beings, we also have, um, we also have um, a tendency to have preferences. And the research will show that you know, creative thinking is universal. It, it has these discrete steps as I just described to you. And each of these steps require uh, unique mental skills. And some of us prefer um, some steps, some stages over others where we either we get energized by them or we lose energy or that it's, it's more of a struggle. Um, and these preferences can show up both as strengths and as blind spots, especially when you're working on a team with other folks. And so awareness of your own style and where your energy is in the creative process can really help, especially with teams in terms of a short circuiting uh, conflict, improving collaboration, and the ability to leverage style differences to be a, a better performing team and improve improved performance. So I'm going to do a little um, test with you. So when I think about this, um, so I've got, imagine in my hand, I have um, a can of spray paint and I am going to, everyone get ready. I'm going to throw a can of spray paint right through the screen to you. And I'm going to ask you to catch, everyone get ready to catch this can of spray paint. And when you catch the can of spray paint, I want you to very quickly, in, in the air, write your initials really large. Okay, everyone ready? You're everyone ready to catch? I don't see hands up. Are you ready to catch? Okay, I'm throwing the can. Ready, set, go. There you go. And when you're done, slap your legs. Okay. So raise your hand if you wrote your initials with your dominant hand, the hand you write with. Yeah, everyone? Was there anyone, yes, was there anyone who actually caught with your non-dominant hand out of curiosity? Was there anybody? I'm not seeing a yes. Or did anyone, maybe someone caught with two hands? Okay. Well, that handedness, this is what we call handedness that um, you know, if I was handing you a pen or a pencil, you would tend to automatically go forward with your dominant hand, the hand you write with. Well, that's sort of like when it's time to, uh, to work on a team and solve problems, we tend to reach for the challenge with our dominant thinking style. And so, which can be a good thing, but it can also get in the way if we're not being open to other ways of seeing things. So if I am reaching out you know, with my dominant style and I'm working with Wesley on a team and he's got a different style, you know, that can create, cause some creative tension, some, some friction. We'll spend a little bit more time exploring that. So I'm going to describe it. I'm going to ask you to take a piece of paper and on the paper, write one, two, three, four. So almost stack it up. One, two, three, four. And I'm going to describe this is not going to be heavily scientific, but I'm going to describe in a little bit more detail the different styles. And as I describe them, I'm going to say, I want you to say like, does this sound like me? Does this sound like me? So the first is the clarifier. The clarifier likes to 
identify the challenge. They like to turn over all the puzzle pieces. They really want to understand what's going on. They're curious about the, the data and the consumer insight. And um, they want to be able to ask a lot of questions and, and really make sure that they're working on the right challenge. That's the clarifier. The ideator, these folks, they like to generate ideas. I've got an idea, I've got an idea, I've got another idea. Um, so they just like to generate, very generative, lots of ideas. The developer, I think of these folks as, these are your engineers. These are the folks who like to take ideas and make them workable. They wanna stress test them. They wanna look at the pluses and the minuses and really develop out the plan and, and get it perfect. Um, developers really want it to be a hundred percent and really that detailed plan and make sure it's working. And then the implementers, these are your Nike folks. They just want to get stuff done. They want to, there's, it's about movement. It's about moving something forward. Not so much about the planning and everything else, but it's really getting stuff done. So I know this wasn't highly scientific, but if, um, Clarifier sounded, sounded like you against number one, right? What is the thing that sounds the most like you? So clarifier, ideator, developer, implementer, what sounds the most like you? And then against number four, what is, sounds the least like you? It's not that you can't do this, but it's not really where you wanna hang out on a Saturday. So what's the most like you against number one? Number four is the least like you. Then against number two, what's the second most like you? And number four, three is whatever's left over. So number one, the most like you, two, three, four. So again, very scientific. Um, so we're put, not putting numbers in here, so it's hard to read. So I'm curious about people's number ones. So we're kind of across the board. We've got a lot of implementers, but I'm not sure if that's a number one or a number developers. Okay, cool. It wouldn't be very surprising to me, folks who are interested in design, having a high correlation toward ideator and developer would be an assumption that I would have. Um, so, and I can't stress enough that preference does not equal ability. I'm personally someone who has a very high preference for ideation, for idea generation, and for implementation. Um, I have almost zero clarifier and zero developer in me. And it's not that I can't do it. It just takes a lot more energy and a lot more focus. And even when I think I've been the best clarifier in the world and really understood the backstory, I'm not gonna be anywhere near as good at it as somebody who has a natural tendency to it. I will always kind of give it a little bit more of a, uh, a short shift and, be, and want to jump to ideas. So it's kind of paying attention to that tendency. And as we go forward, playing with some tools and process, I'd like you to kind of pay attention to how you're responding and reacting and what energy you're showing up with. Sound good? Okay. So with that, um, we're gonna shift a little bit into tool set and skill set and playing with some different tools as well as the, the key principles underlying creative process. So as I said, we're gonna spend some time on core principles. So first, um, a really important principle is to asking problems as questions. So often when we say, you know, we don't have enough money, that's just a, a statement of condition of fact. And where can you go with that? How might we get more money? Automatically opens up a, a, a challenge to being solved. So uh, my good friend, Sarah Thurber is gonna talk to you a little bit about how might we. Today's tip is about the secret power of language. You see language and creativity are joined at the hip. In the words of philosopher Peter Strawman, language is the vehicle of thought. And after a point, what we can't say, we can't think. I'm Sarah Thurber, and this is your thinking tip from Forsyth. So words have the power to influence thoughts. I don't just mean your words influence my thoughts. I mean, your words influence your thoughts. 
The words you choose to describe a problem can actually influence your ability to solve it. Let's try this out. Listen to the difference between these two sentences. One, these meetings are unproductive. Two, how might we make these meetings more productive? They both acknowledge the same problem, unproductive meetings. But the words in the first sentence frame it as a statement of fact, a fixed reality, sometimes known as a complaint. The second sentence, how might we make these meetings more productive, is a question. It invites solutions. It even suggests that you might be coming up with some of those solutions. The key phrase, how might we, is the secret to triggering new thinking. Turning your problem or complaint into an open-ended question automatically sets your mind working on creative solutions. It's not even happening on a conscious level. Now, you try it. Here's the problem. We can't afford a vacation. Turn it into a question. Start with, how might we? How might we take a vacation? There you go. Bon voyage. The phrase, how might we, actually made headlines in a recent Harvard Business Review article called How Might We, the secret phrase top innovators use. So next time you have a problem, watch your language. Phrase it as a question with words like how might we. If your words can ask it, your brain can solve it. That's your thinking tip from Foresight. So Foresight is also um, the clarifier, ideator, developer, implementer data that I was sharing with you is a lot of the work that comes out of that organization. So how might we is, oh, there we go. So next uh, key principle underlying good creative process is what we call separate your thinking. And that's separating what we call divergent thinking. So that is that, that broad, open-ended thinking that we, I, a lot of times you, you'll hear me say throughout the rest of our time together is make a list. So it's being generative um, and creating. And a lot of times we think about that as ideating. So generating. Then once we've generated lots and lots of options, whether we're generating data, whether we're generating ideas, whether we're generating action steps, uh, we come back and we, we want to keep pushing out to get out of that, out of that safe zone, that stuff that we've already done before, the familiar, and push out broader to those undiscovered areas of discovery. Once we've done that, we then come back and converge and make choices and narrow it down. And we'll we're gonna spend some time practicing this, frankly, throughout the rest of our time together, practicing good divergence and convergence. It's very often that people will you know, generate one idea and just go with that first one. You know, but what about the second right idea, the fifth right idea, the hundredth right idea? So we want to give ourselves more choices to get out of the obvious into the, into the new. So with that, we're going to practice uh, good divergent thinking. And there's some guidelines for good divergent thinking. And so I'm going to ask you all to make sure you have some paper in front of you and something to write with. And I'm going to show you an and um, abstract an image. And I'm gonna ask you to generate, and this is, you know, often we might do this with teams, but in the Zoom land, we're gonna be doing this as a solo activity. And I'm gonna ask you just to create a list. What's this? What else could it be? What else could it be? And your goal is to generate as many items as you can in one minute. So what's this? What else could it be? I'm gonna ask you just make a list. Okay, so if everyone stop, and if you can total up the number of items on your list, you don't need to say what they are, but just um, let's see some numbers. I'd love to hear how many you came up with. Okay, and so and keep track of that first number that you've got. So the first, first guideline to good divergent thinking is to defer judgment. So um, defer judgment, negative judgment. So um, especially when you're working with a group and maybe you had an idea that you, you know, the, that you thought was silly or maybe it was politically incorrect. And so you tend to censor yourself. And so you, you negatively judge your idea and you don't share it or you don't write it down or maybe it seemed too simple. Um, so that negative judgment. And we really just wanna push that aside. 
but even more insidious than negative judgment is positive judgment. You know, so maybe you're looking at this image and you see it's a ball. And once you see it's a ball, it can't be anything else. And so you sort of what we call satisfice on that first right idea. But again, what about the second right idea, the fifth right idea, the 50th right idea? So we really want to push back and defer judgment. Anything goes. OK, so I'm going to give you another another object, uh, another minute and ask you to really push against and defer judgment, negative judgment, and just make a list as many as things as you can come up with. So what's this? What else could it be? Make a list, one minute. So again, if you could tally up the number of items on your list, let's see. Oh, so look at that, that jumped up 17, 16. So we're seeing some higher numbers, sometimes just getting warmed up. It's also, I think, sometimes harder. I know for me, it's harder when I'm working by myself. I feed off of what other people are doing, and that helps me build even more. So the next, next guideline is building on ideas. So um, building on your own ideas, certainly building on the ideas of others. Uh, that's one, I think, one of the challenges being in the Zoom world. But later on, we're going to be in breakout groups, and we'll be able to really build off of each other. So, um, you know, before we had uh, the pictures, the, the little blue ball. So if that's a ball, it could be a soccer ball. It could be a football. It could be a baseball. It could be any other kind of ball you imagine. Or um, maybe you saw the blue and you said it's a planet. If it's a planet, it could be Pluto. It could be Jupiter. It could be Saturn. It could be Earth and so on. So just building on attributes and features. But it's all just about creating a longer list. So another guideline is to seek wild ideas. So before I mentioned Alex Osborne, he's the, that Owen BBDO who coined the term brainstorming. You know, and Alex said, it's easier to tame a wild idea than it is to invigorate one that doesn't have any life. So don't censor yourself. Whatever comes to mind, let's capture those wild ideas. So I'm going to give you another image another minute, I'm going to ask you to really work hard at deferring judgment, try to build off your ideas. So again, if it's a, if it's Saturn, it could be Pluto or Earth or Mars, etc. So build on your ideas and go wild. Anything goes, write it down. Okay, everyone ready? All right, here we go. What's this? What else could it be? So 20, so we've got some pretty big numbers. So curious, um, did you have progress? So yes, no, maybe. Did you see an improvement over time? Great, yeah, in the last one. And sometimes it's like a muscle. You know, the more you practice, the more you do it, the better you get at, the more fluent you become. Um, I know for me, if I'm working with other people, my divergent muscle is a lot stronger than when I'm working by myself. Um, so the last guideline, is to go for quantity. Set a stretch target. Say, no matter what, I'm going to go for 20 and then push past. Set, so set a target. Um, Linus Pauling, two-time Nobel Prize winner says, you know, the best way to have good ideas is to have lots of ideas. You know, so give yourself more choices, more options. So, um, Curious, because I usually get asked this, what these images actually are. It's a brush. There we go. It's actually a toothbrush under a microscope. The previous, the, the one with the balls, any ideas on that? I would say, yeah, gross candy. It's Mars candy under a microscope. And the uh, this one, any guesses? It's something sticky yes actually it is something sticky it's actually honeycomb honeycomb so all of these different things under a microscope honey there you go um anyway i just know for people who are clarifiers that would have driven you mad all night if you didn't know the answers to that so ideators probably didn't care um so now that we've had a chance to diverge and we've generated lots of options it's now time to then sift through those options and converge. And if, um, if you've had any experience working um, in large organizations, 
often this is when all those really amazing creative ideas go to die, is what, at least what can happen in some organizations. You know, we brainstormed all these really great options and then people kick in with the, oh, we've done that before, or yes, but, or it's too risky, and so on, and so on. And so part of um, good convergence and making choices is about um, preventing yourself from killing a good idea or an idea that has possibility before it has a, a chance to live. And so the guidelines we talk about is being deliberate, being focused, really looking at every idea possibility before you make a final choice. Uh, check back against your object objectives that you haven't strayed too far from what it is you're really trying to solve for or to create. Always with an idea of continuing to improve your idea. That first right idea on a post-it note may not be where you end up. So continue to evolve it, be affirmative. And that's looking at focusing on the positive and staying open to novelty, especially don't rule out those wild ideas. Again, you can always tame something back. And we'll have a chance to play with this more and revisit these convergent thinking guidelines. Um, another key principle, we start with praise first. So, you know, imagine um, you have a little, a little brother, a little sister or a niece or a nephew or a next door neighbor and they, they come home with this amazing uh, portrait that they've colored in school. Now you don't start with the, oh, I can't believe, why is your skin green or purple hair? Who has purple hair? No, you say, oh, what a pretty princess. And oh, I love the bright use of color. You're gonna start and praise first. Well, the same thing with ideas. Ideas are like children. They need to be nurtured um, and supported, not criticized. So we wanna start with the positive first. So another key principle. And so now shifting gears, because um, I think a lot about, you know, good, good creativity, good collaboration has a lot to do similarities to improv. Do any of you watch Saturday Night Live? Or you've been to an improv show? Has anyone actually um, ever done improv training? Um, well, I have to say that I was never one who really wanted to get up and do improv, but I decided it was a challenge for myself. So I did all the, the coursework at Second City in Toronto. Um, and really, I did find that it, it, it made me a more nimble thinker. It certainly made me not afraid to get up on stage and make a fool out of myself. But there's some really great principles uh, behind improv, especially when it comes to collaboration. It's about, especially when you're working on a team, trusting each other, having each other's back, um, embracing mistakes. And one of the things we talk about in improv is about we high five when we screw up. So we're saying that to Wesley, every time we mess up on the technology tonight, we're gonna high five each other. Um, you know, be present, actively listen. You've got to pay attention because in improv, when you know someone is starting a scene and they throw out an offer to you, you've got to be a, pay attention to be able to take it and move with it. And uh, underlying all of that is this attitude of what we call yes and. And I'd love us to play with this in practice being good yes and, because with yes and and improv, when we apply that to creative process, gets you much better results. So everyone willing to play a very small, not getting on the stage improv game? Okay. So with this, what we're going to do is, um, we have some actually instructions. So Wesley, I think the best thing to do is we'll work in pairs um, and then it'll be the same pair. We'll send people off and bring them back three different times as we do the different layers of this. I think it's gonna be the best way. Um, so, and we're probably gonna be high-fiving each other a few times on this one. <laughs> so let's see if we can get this to work. Okay, so let me, I'll explain the activity to you. And I think this is gonna work. I've never quite done it on Zoom before. So this is a bit of an experiment. So yes, and I mentioned is the improv principle that you accept and build on each other's ideas. And so we're going to, in pairs, I'm going to ask you to decide once you're in the breakout room with, with your partner and you'll be together uh, for this whole exercise, decide who's going to be A and who's going to be B. And so I'm going to send you off 
and, and, and when you're in your breakout room, actually you don't really even need to set a timer because Wes is gonna whip you back after a minute, right? Okay, so um, round number one, I'm going to ask whoever's A to go first and they're going to share ideas for an amazing virtual party, the most epic virtual party you can possibly imagine. So you're going to share an idea and B, your partner is going to say no because, and they're going to give her a reason why it's not going to work. So we're going to go off for one minute. A is going to share epic ideas for a virtual party and B is going to say no because and why it's going to fail. So I, I'm assuming that that kind of felt a little lousy. It probably felt it a little lousy also for some of you squashing the other person though. Other people like to say no. Um, so round two, same approach, but this time B, uh, the person who was no because, is going to share ideas for this epic, amazing virtual party. And A is going to respond with yes, or and share a totally different idea. Yeah, so how did that yes or feel? I know for me, it always feels really passive aggressive. It's actually, I'd rather someone say no than give me a yes or. All right, so we're gonna do one more round, but this time we're gonna, both A and B are gonna take turns sharing ideas using yes and, and really work on building, working together to build the most epic virtual party imaginable. And we'd love to hear at the end, um, you post kind of what you came up with of, of an epic party idea. So, um, well, thank you for your patience with this one. We weren't quite sure if the yes ending virtually like this was gonna work, but, um, but it gives you just a sense of that, that different layers and really resisting the no because or the yes or and paying attention to when you're sort of frankly working with other folks and crushing their own creative spirit by yes oring them. Um, but focusing on that yes and, that yes and mentality, that yes and mindset. So, um, so that was sort of some of the uh, core principles that I wanted to focus on with you, that everyone's creative, that importance of separating divergent and convergent thinking, asking problems as questions, as Sarah had phrased, how might we, or in what ways might we, what might be all the ways. So asking problems, invitational questions, having a yes and mindset, using affirmative judgment that praise first, you think about that, you know, the coloring picture with the green skin and the purple hair and having a creative attitude and collaborating. And we're gonna take that forward as we now play with some uh, creative thinking tools. And so, so we talk about the creative process, clarify, ideate, develop, implement, and um, it's cyclical, but a lot of times it also will bounce back that sometimes where you enter in the process, you don't always enter in right at the beginning at clarifying and turning over the puzzle pieces. It may be that it's, you know, we, we're very clear on the question and we're gonna jump right into ideas or we've already got a detailed plan and we're gonna plan for implementation. Or sometimes you need to step back and um, backtrack because you don't have all the, the information that you need to go forward with. Um, so with that, we're going to play with some tools. And so to do this, the challenge that we're going to work on this evening is how might we improve the bathtub? I think I mentioned earlier, I have done some work with, with Kohler, so I've probably spent more time on bathtubs and showers than, uh, than I would like. But I thought it would be an easy topic that we could all relate to, um, to just practice some tools. So what I'm going to do is introduce you to um, a series of tools that you'll work on individually, but then we're going to work in, in larger groups as we take some of these ideas and then uh, develop them out. Sound good? Okay, so um, in this case, so your challenge is going to be how might we improve the bathtub? And I will, as we move forward with this, as a designer, I want you to think about, you know, what's the itch behind this? You know, why, why would you need to improve the bathtub? Who might you be designing for? What challenges uh, might that person be facing? So in the back of my, because right now it's an open, it's an open field. Um, I'm not going to provide you with data that's very specific. So basically, 
you can decide those answers, who you want to design for, what challenges are they're facing, okay? And so I'm going to ask you to have pen and uh, paper ready or markers or post-its. And first, we're going to start off with ideating and thinking up lots of options, exploring new combinations, building on ideas. And I'm going to introduce you to a series of um, idea generation tools. Um, just a side tip. You know, one of the things when we talk about shower thinking and why do you get your best ideas when you're in the shower, when you're driving, is often when we have a challenge to work on, when you step away from it, when you're doing something else, suddenly all these other idea possibilities will flood in. Flood in. I mean, I will always have, um, you know, my, my phone in my pocket. So if I'm coming up with ideas when I'm out walking the dog, you'll often see me, you know, either texting myself ideas or recording ideas. So capturing, writing down ideas whenever you have them so you don't lose them. So with that, first tool is going to be basically post-it note brainstorming. So right on the top of your page, um, what might, you know, how to improve the bathtub. And then I'd like you to just first burst whatever comes to mind. And for three minutes, we're going to set the timer and write down as many ideas as you can in three minutes for improving the bathtub. And remember to defer judgment, build on your ideas, and seek wild ideas. The crazier, the better. As many as you can come up with. So if you can stop, we're going to move on. So another tool. I'm just going to throw a couple of different ones at you. Uh, the next one is looking at the challenge from different perspectives. So, um, and these are some prompts. So I'd like you to come up and, and if you have more than what's on the target, that's great. But two ideas from a child, uh, two ideas from your favorite superhero or movie star or athlete. So it could be your favorite Marvel character or you know, whoever you want. So at least two ideas there, two ideas from a, uh, your, your grandparents or a senior that you know, and two, two ideas from your pet. So another divergent tool is called a forced connection. So this is when we take um, force a connection between your challenge, so how, um, how to improve the bathtub, and something completely unrelated. So we take this unrelated image and we look at what are some of the attributes of this or characteristics or attributes of this other, other thing. And then we ask, what ideas do I get for solving my bathtub challenge based on this other, other thing? So I'll give you an example. So this was actually a challenge a good friend of mine worked on. They were doing some work for Frito-Lay and the challenge was, you know, what might be creative possibilities for a new fun hand to mouth snack. And so they were doing a forced connection and they brought in pictures of all this different uh, industrial equipment. And so what they, what were some of the attributes that they listed? Moves a lot of dirt, destructive, plow, dumps, noisy, rolling, scooping, wish I could drive one construction. So these are some of the attributes that they came up with. And then they started to take those different attributes to generate some new ideas for a, a, a new Frito-Lay product. So any idea what the snack was that they came up with from this? You got it. So this was exactly how they came up with Frito-Lay scoops. So they looked at a bulldozer and said, new snack idea. So ideas can come from anywhere. So we're gonna play with some forced connections in relation to your bathtub experience. So looking at this picture, um, what are some attributes when you look at uh, the picture of this fruit? So fresh, wet, healthy. So I mean, when you look at this challenge, thinking about some of these attributes, see if you can come up with at least three new ideas, three new ideas for a better bathtub, an improved bathtub. 
looking for inspiration from some of these attributes that you can see in the list, whichever one resonates with you. Try three new ideas and force a connection. Okay, we're gonna try another one. So another forced connection. So when I look at this, what ideas do I get for solving better bathtub? Last divergent prompt. So I'd like you to think about what are the worst ideas you can think of? The one that if you do this, someone's going to get seriously injured or you're going to end up going to jail. So ways to improve the bathtub, the worst ideas you can think of. And so as you're looking at some of these really bad ideas, is there any way to twist it, turn it, take these really bad ideas and, and convert it and look for, is there an essence of a, a germ of something? Well, made of rough wood. Well, what if it had some texture that sort of created a massage or that was almost like, um, you think of the sand, you know, sand at the bottom of a, you know, sand in the ocean. Well, you could have like sand in your tub, a shaving tub and so on. Shag rug liner. Oh, that just sounds gross. Okay. Anyway, you get the point. So we now have kind of a, a list of options and it's time to now start converging. And so I'm going to ask you, looking at your list, you have quite a few items now, to circle every, anything that's intriguing, it's interesting, it stands out. It has a spark to it. It might have, it's not quite formed yet, but it, eh, there's something there that you're curious about. And I'm gonna really ask you to resist just ruling things out. Again, you wanna nurture, give things a chance to breathe. So just circle anything that's interesting, intriguing, that just has maybe a germ of a possibility and review your list. Okay, I'm gonna ask you to stand up and put your thumb in front of you like you're a, a painter taking a rendering, taking a perspective, okay? And so I'm gonna ask you to then, with your feet planted, you're going to follow your thumb around your body without moving your feet, just twisting from your, from your waist and follow your thumb like a clock as far around your body as you can go without injuring yourself and see how far you can get and kind of mark where you've gotten to and then slowly come all the way back to the front. Don't push too hard that you hurt yourself until you're facing at 12 o'clock again, okay? And come all the way back to the front. Okay, now I'm gonna ask you to close your eyes, close your eyes and imagine that you have your thumb out in front of you like you're a painter taking a rendering and imagine following your thumb around your body. Imagine you've gone past you know, three o'clock, 3.30 and back and imagine getting to where you got before and imagine pushing further and then imagine coming all the way back to the front Okay, open your eyes and put your thumb out in front of you again. And let's repeat the live exercise. So follow your thumb around your body as far as you can go like a clock and see where you got to. Then come all the way back. So did you get any further? Yes, thumbs up. Did you get further? Yes, yeah, so yes, excellent. Come on back. Take your seats. Partly that's just to stretch a little bit, but it's also to kind of hit the point that part of the reason we add a lot of these tools is we can always stretch more. We can always have more ideas. And so it's really giving ourselves that ability to stretch and also to look at different perspectives. And I think I just needed to move a little bit. So with that, um, you've had a chance to converge your list. And we're now moving into the develop stage. And so we wanna take these idea possibilities and make them more workable and detail them out. And um, we're going to be shifting to work in teams now.
So you're going to be, uh, I'm going to give you a little bit more background, but then you're going to be put into teams of four-ish people, depending on how the numbers work. So, but first I want to give you a little bit of background um, in terms of develop and the tools that we're going to be using. So uh, with develop, we're going to strengthen the ideas and prototype them out, help them come to life. And this is to evaluate and strengthen ideas, take ideas that are little possibilities and really flesh them out and make them great. Really challenge you to consider novelty to some of those wild, wacky, weird ideas that you may have come up with. Play with those. Um, remember to use affirmative judgment. We want to start with praise first. And um, this is also going to create an opportunity to overcome any of the weaknesses and strengthen ideas. Okay. And when I'm, then these tools are going to be shared with you. So um, this is one of my favorite tools. I can't tell you how many times I've been with a group and we're in the ideation phase and we have all these little idea possibilities, but they're all a little on the lame side. And boy, when we get them into power, suddenly they just become magic. Um, so here's the instructions. And these are, I would actually take a screenshot of this. We're also gonna upload them to you, but just in case, take a picture of this. Um, Appoint someone to be your scribe, to be the note taker for the group. Um, we're going to send you a, a PowerPoint document that you can use, or you can open up your own Word document, but to capture, capture information. Um, the person whose first name is closest to Z is going to go first. Okay. Each person shares three ideas. So thinking about that list that you already have, um, two ideas that your favorites and one of your ideas that's really out there, your wild idea. And Kimberly, your challenge, you've got to do something new. You can't use the one you've already got, okay? Um, so two favorites and one out there wild idea. And then as a team, so each of you will share, and as a team, you're going to choose one idea to further develop using power. So you're gonna look at the positives, the objections, the what else is, but I'm really gonna ask you to fill out that form, that the template that, I, that we're providing you with. Um, and, then, and then really taking all that into account, how does the idea evolve out? Um, then you will capture the idea using the idea T template that we've provided. So basically, and I'll show you this, um, that a stranger could read this and get it, understand it, and get excited about it without you being present to explain it so that it can stand independently. And this is a sample of an idea T. And you've been sent this template. So you want to give it a snappy headline, a simple snappy headline. And then you want to give um, a sentence or two description and even some supporting descriptive bullet points. And then sketch a fun image, you know, you've all got your computers there. So if you want to drag in a picture, that's fine too. Often we will even build something out and model it if we were in a live setting. So you're just going to do a really quick little idea T. So with that, I'm going to the last thing we're going to ask you to do is we're going to go back into your teams um, just for say, quick three minutes. And I'd like you and take a shot of this or just write it down. I'd like you to take three minutes as your team and talk about kind of what happened. What was your experience in the past two hours we've been together? So think of like you're a CSI uh, crime scene investigator. Just what happened? The what? The so what? So what do you think about that? What do you feel about that? Um, do you like it? Did you hate it? Um, and then the now what? What might you do with any of... Uh, what you've just learned and experienced. What sticks? What might you throw out? Well, so Wesley and I were going to have a, a virtual dance party. So if any of you want to hang out and do that, otherwise, we're just going to say good night. Hopefully, I'll see you at uh, Mind Camp Connect. You're very welcome. There's a lot of cool people hanging out doing interesting stuff.